Ah, uh, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We have a great show for you today. As always, we are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash takes by fans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to, uh, to our YouTube channel, YouTube... <laughs> Head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, folks. However you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, today is a big old Thursday, so we have an NBA player spotlight today. We do that every Tuesday, Thursday. Today's hint of who we're doing today, he's a little bit of an all-star snub. He got traded from a potential finals team to a probably not even playoff team, unfortunately. And we do kind of brag about him a lot here on the show. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And then also we are on day 11 of our 73 NFL draft countdown where we look at an NFL draft prospect every single day. In today's clue for our NFL draft prospect, he's kind of the forgotten receiver in kind of the top tier wide receivers of this draft. We all know Jamar Chase. We all know uh, Devontae Smith. But there's a kind of this third that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, So those are kind of the two clues of the two mystery players we will be taking a look at today on the show. And as always, breaking down the NBA and going over our stories of the day. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. And man, oh man, oh man, oh man, I don't even know what to make of this but um let's just preface it by saying this i mean every off season i mean there's kind of lower football content people need to make up stories people need something to talk about so you know there are a lot of kind of fake stories maybe embellished stories embellished rumors going out there this happens every single year during the nfl off season because you know espn they need content fox sports they all need content they all have got multiple sports shows to talk about 24 7 that they need content to talk about so we do get some fake stories here and there now we get the Russell Wilson topic I mean if you told like going into like this offseason going into this season just alone I would have never thought Russell Wilson would play anywhere else besides Seattle I mean it just looks like he loves playing there he loves Pete Carroll it seems like they've got a great relationship but now in this offseason we we're just seeing a ton of cracks and we're getting all these stories about Russell Wilson being out and I honestly don't even know if they're true or not I don't know if we should be putting a lot of stock into these stories but here we go more stories here Russell Wilson quote stormed out of a meeting with coaches after his ideas for fixing the offense were dismissed prior to their Thursday night game versus Arizona in the season um, there's an Atlantic article that came out. Unfortunately, you have to pay. You have to subscribe to the Atlantic to read the whole article. Lame, lame. Uh, so we don't have the full article. We just have little tidbits here and there. So we get, you know, the offense not listening to him. And we know that the Seahawks just fired their offensive coordinator, Brian Schottenheimer, during this offseason. So was he the main reason? Do Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson like each other? Was it just kind of the offensive coordinator that just wasn't seeing eye to eye with Russell Wilson? And now they fixed the problem, but everybody else is just sticking with the story that Russell Wilson wants out of Seattle we don't know but then we get this we get another quote here more in this article after watching the Bucks Chiefs Super Bowl in Tampa Russell Wilson spoke with Pete Carroll to discuss how they'll fix the offensive line Wilson wanted to know the team's plan but it wasn't related to them so they're not even telling him what their plans are and how do you have how do you have a franchise quarterback that has won you a Super Bowl who that's got you to the Super Bowl twice two years in a row yeah right two years in a row they lost the second time against the Patriots um but how do you how do you not have input from your main guy your main quarterback who's really the the most who deserves a lot of you know the credit of their kind of short-lived dynasty obviously you know the Legion of Boom deserves kind of you know a solid portion of the credit but so does the offense I mean you have to score points in this league and Russell Wilson he's always been fantastic that I mean he's never had a losing season he's never went like less than eight and eight and that's talking about his rookie season as well like he's he's he stepped up immediately here in Seattle so how are we not respecting his decision how are you not getting his input on what he feels like should be 
the direction of the team. I mean, he should have not as much say as, you know, the coach and the general manager as all that, but he should have some solid input. And you definitely should be, you know, telling him your plans of the future if you want this guy to stay and kind of battle for your organization and, you know, put up, you know, what he can do and be the best he can be. Because if you're, if, if he's not included into your future plans, he, he doesn't, and he doesn't feel like he's going to belong, maybe he's going to want to go somewhere else request a trade and we will talk about that in a second because he may have done that already but how do you just not get the input from one of your main players here so Russell Wilson wanted to know how to dis- how do um, the team's plan to fix the offensive line but it wasn't related to him at least not to his satisfaction and then we get this right here Russell Wilson's camp has approached the Seattle Seahawks for a per- potential trade like that is insane trading Russell Wilson like that is just unheard of it's kind of like a, a talent that is Deshaun Watson but if Deshaun Watson was like in a great organization that you know he won a Super Bowl with so Russell Wilson will he be a Seattle Seahawk next year I would say yes I, I don't see him leaving I don't see Seattle just trading him away I just don't understand what is going I don't know if these stories are real or if these are just fake stories to get interest so people can start talking about them I really cannot grasp this story usually I, I've got a pretty good <laughs> Usually I've got a pretty good eye and I can kind of spot nonsense a little bit, kind of like that Teddy Bridgewater stuff, that Teddy Bridgewater talk. I'm still taking that as nonsense as well. I just really don't know what's going on here with Seattle. I thought it was going to just be kind of Brian Schottenheimer because if we just dissect the entire problem of what Seattle did this season, they were great the first half of the season. Everything was working and then they were kind of garbage in the second half of the season. Nothing was working offensively. So they sh- they fired their offensive coordinator. I think that was kind of the main problem there and I think it's kind of solved now since they're going to be bringing in somebody else um that's just my take i don't see C- uh russell wilson leaving seattle but you know um rumorly here um uh, they said that his camp has approached seattle for a potential trade so i don't know what to make of it We'll see where he goes. We'll see if he ever gets traded. I don't see him being traded he is the face of this franchise i mean it's russell wilson and If you have a chance to go get Russell Wilson in a trade, you definitely go get him here. And then we get potential destinations include. I mean, people love talking about that. Hey, if somebody wants to get traded, here's all the teams that want him right right off the rip. So uh, they include the Dolphins, the Jets, the Saints, and the Raiders. The Saints, I mean, Drew Brees is coming back. And then they got Jameis Winston. I mean, obviously, Russell Wilson is better than Jameis Winston. But I I don't really think the Saints are in the market for a quarterback, especially a large contract quarterback. They might want to try and downsize it a little bit since, you know, Drew Brees is kind of at the tail end there. Uh, Raiders, potential there. You know, Derek Carr, who knows if they stay with him. Dolphins, yeah, I mean, I, that that's fine if you go and get Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson and probably Deshaun Watson are the only two quarterbacks that I would kind of take over Tua right now just because, you know, I, I want to see established players. I don't want to see potential established players, potential players great players so if you have a chance to go get an absolute playmaker right now I would definitely give clearance for the Dolphins to go after Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson I don't think either of those happen but uh and then the Jets also in this kind of potential destinations for Russell Wilson and I don't think Russell Wilson would want to go to the Jets or the Raiders because they're they're kind of dysfunctional organizations and he's if he's in a dysfunctional organization where the where the coaches aren't talking to him and kind of giving him the details of what they're doing with this season and moving forward He's not going to want to go to another team that's doing the same exact thing that he has no relationship and no chemistry with. So I would exclude the Jets and the Raiders right off the bat. Uh, The Saints, uh, I think they're rocking with Drew Brees for another year. Whether, you know, it it really just depends on what what Drew Brees is doing. And then the Dolphins, it seems like they're going to stick with Tua. So I'm going to kind of grade this story a little phony. I'm going to grade this overall story of Russell Wilson not being happy in Seattle a tiny bit phony. Tiny bit phony. All right, moving on, J.J. Watt. All right, we got kind of three teams here that they're saying. J.J. Watt is choosing between the Titans, the Bills, and the Packers, according to John Clayton. So... We told y'all he was sending hits and all those tweets that he was going to Buffalo. So we are still saying bet it, uh, bet all your money on if you can get some decent value that J.J. Watt will be a bill this season. We'll see uh, the Titans, definitely an interesting spot there, can definitely help their defense out a little bit. But really, it's just going to come down to Ryan Tannehill. That is really it. When, it. when the game's on the line and he has to go and throw the ball and has to make the throws because they can't run the ball anymore, he needs to start stepping up. So I don't really 
really think the defense is too much of the problem there in Tennessee. JJ, JJ Watt would just be a huge elevation to their defense. And then the Packers, I would love to see him go to the Packers as well, helping Aaron Rodgers get another ring. That's kind of the biggest thing for Aaron Rodgers here in kind of the last couple, two, three seasons of his career, however long he's going to play. He needs at least another ring. They need maybe the defense to step it up a little bit. I mean, the defense did fine in that uh, NFC Championship game. I mean, they pick off Brady three straight times in the second half. It's just Aaron Rodgers couldn't get it done offensively. So the defense isn't really the problem there in Tennessee or um, Green Bay. And, uh, you know, going to the Bills, he seems like a blue-collar guy. We've watched him in, you know, Houston for his entire career. Je definitely just seems kind of like a blue-collar guy. And Buffalo's all blue-collar, baby, jumping through flaming tables an hour before the kickoff of the game in the parking lot. You can't get any more blue-collar than that, folks. So J.J. Watt to Buffalo, it's still standing. We get it narrowed down here to three teams. 33% chance, I'm saying, and I'm saying it's 100% chance he's going to Buffalo. Those tweets, folks, those were cryptic tweets. Everything on Twitter is a clue. Come on, got to get with the program, folks. Alrighty, moving on. Marcus Mariota, trade talks have, quote, dried up significantly. Darn it. We wanted it. I mean, that one, I know it's only one game, but it was truly super impressive to me, especially what he went through with Tennessee. He was really looking kind of really not good, that tail end of Tennessee where Ryan Tannehill takes his job. But, um, I mean, that one game was looking good, really kind of hoping he was kind of going to be able to kind of slowly revitalize his career a little bit. But uh, now nobody wants, to, <laughs> nobody wants to take him. Maybe, you know, the, the asking price for him was a little too high, which I don't understand why it would be that high in the first place, but maybe the Raiders were trying to make a quick buck. He's definitely a solid backup here for uh, the Raiders. I mean, he came in, stepped up. I think they ended up losing the game. I don't think it was his fault, but I think they ended up losing that game. It was a close game, kept him in it, and that's all you need the backup quarterback to do. When your starting quarterback goes down or can't play, backup comes in and just, be, it just is going to be the game manager. Keep the game close. Let one of your other playmakers, either on defense or a wide receiver or running back, go and win you the game. All you have to do is be a game manager, and that's what he was when he backed up Derek Carr for his one lone start here in the Las Vegas Raiders. So I I want to see him go somewhere. Obviously, you know, with all the draft quarterbacks and, you know, all these potential better quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, I mean, you're not going to go and trade for Marcus Mariota. You're going to want to see where those other quarterbacks fall before you go out and, you know, trade for Marcus. Marcus Mariota. So Marcus Mariota could still potentially be a starter here, but he's definitely going to have to wait. He's got to wait in line. He's, he's, what is he, third in line right now? What, what quarterbacks are we still talking about? Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson. Those are like the only quarterbacks that are potential up for trade. So Marcus Mariota has to take his place in line, grab that ticket because he's right now number third quarterback in line. So that's the, uh, the trade talks have dried up significantly, but let's, you know, give it a week or two when, you know, Russell Wilson kind of solidifies that he's staying in Seattle. Deshaun Watson finally gets traded somewhere or, you know, Houston just shuts down the rumor saying, no, we're keeping him. Stop asking. We're not taking any offers. And then people will start calling about Marcus Mariota again. But I definitely can't see this man another starter, another year. Give him another year. I think he's earned another year to prove himself as a starting quarterback in this league. All righty, and then more quarterback news here. We get, uh, I mean, everybody, I mean, this we, we've been talking about Jimmy G not being on the 49ers ever since he got there. Uh, as soon as he got there, you know, everyone was like, all right, is this the right decision? He seems good, but is this the right decision? Then he got injured. Then everybody was like, all right, you got to get rid of him because he can't stay healthy. Then he got them to the Super Bowl and was looking good. Then the fourth quarter came, <laughs> then the fourth quarter came and <laughs> And he floundered pretty bad there. And then they're like, all right, you got to get rid of Jimmy G again. And then he started to play this season, looked pretty decent, and everybody was right back on him. Then he got injured, and everyone's like, all right, you got to ship him out again. So it's like every single season, it's like Jimmy G's our guy, and then Jimmy G needs to go. It's like every season we're getting that huge fluctuation with Jimmy G. But uh, John Lynch says, I really believe that Jimmy is our guy. And I would say the same. I mean, he's solid. He got you to a Super Bowl. That is great. He was good those first three quarters just couldn't really close it out and you can blame that on the defense I mean they still the offense still has to go and score those points right I mean what was a 10 point lead 
14 point lead, 10 or 14. I think it was 10. 10 point lead by the 49ers in the fourth quarter. That defense still gave up all those points. Yeah, Jimmy G didn't make it easy on them by extending the lead or keeping up the pressure offensively, but he still got you to the game. So um, I, I don't really see what's going on here. Jimmy G should be the quarterback here. I mean, we've heard a lot of rumors, you know, early in this offseason. Once again, maybe nonsense stories, fake stories of Jimmy G not being there in the 49ers, them trading him, all of that. But uh, the general manager here, John Lynch, says, hey, he's kind of our guy, so we'll see what's up. But uh, a lot of quarterback news, and that's not surprising. As we said, they got to make up stories. They have to have something to talk about here in the offseason. <clears throat> All right, and I know I say this maybe kind of on a weekly basis, but just that huge improvement Josh Allen had between, you know, his first two seasons and this season. Here it is, Josh Allen's games with 300 or more yards passing, 2018 and 2019, zero. Zero between two seasons of throwing more than 300 yards in a game, and then in this season, 2020, he had eight, half the season. Every other game, 300 yards and probably close to it, probably like, 250 so he'd go 300 250 300 250 300 so this man was absolutely slinging it now that just brings into question is it Josh Allen being good and improving his game or is it Stephon Diggs because we just saw Kirk Cousins do good with Stephon Diggs then he floundered without him Josh Allen was floundering without Stephon Diggs and now rising to the occasion with Stephon Diggs so I'm not going to knock Josh Allen for you know having weapons and using his weapons Josh Allen played absolutely fantastic this season got him to the AFC championship game really could not play any better now in the playoff games he did kind of he did shrink a little bit he wasn't the big Big arm, maybe I'm, I think it is Sean McDermott a little bit. I think Sean McDermott really gets kind of clammy. He clams up in play calling during the playoff games. We saw that in 2019 with all the trickery over the Texans, and we kind of saw this season with Josh Allen not really doing too much in the air, really conservative calls. And I think Sean McDermott is a little bit of a clamor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call him. We'll give him a nickname, the Clamor, as a head coach. He just clams up in these big games. So, but back to Josh Allen here. He's absolutely fantastic this season, so we're not knocking him. He did everything he was supposed to. Worked worked fantastic with Stephon Diggs. I mean, we're taught what, what he ended up at, like 68 or 69% completion percentage. Absolutely fantastic throwing all these yards in these games. So it's going to be interesting when Stephon Diggs finally leaves Buffalo, if he ever does, if Josh Allen kind of regresses when Stephon Diggs is not there. But uh, we got to give Josh Allen credit. Using your weapons, we're not going to penalize you for that. So, a fantastic season by him. Hopefully, he can keep elevating it. This really 2021 season is going to be a huge, it's going to speak volumes. If Josh Allen's kind of even regresses a little bit, it's going to be kind of all Stephon Diggs with this success here in this one lone season. So, I want to see this man step it up. He seems like he's got all, he seems like he's got everything the likability, the leadership, the stats, the intangibles, the tangibles. It really seems like he has everything to kind of be a 10 to 15 year starter, maybe even a future Hall of Famer, potential Super Bowl winner as well. So it looks like he's got all that. I'm rooting for the kid. Absolutely deserved here in Buffalo and uh, hopefully he can keep it going. Alrighty, last two stories here are in the NBA. Here we go. The Celtics CEO and governor, Wyke Grusbeck says Kyrie Irving's departure is one of the main reasons for Boston struggles this year. I do not agree. We got the quote here. We had hoped Kyrie would stay forever and lead us all the way. That change touched off a lot of stuff because he left a bit of a domino effect. So I really don't see how Kyrie Irving really elevated the Celtics team when he was there. The only thing that I could think of that he would att attract free agents, maybe Kyrie wanted everybody to team up in Boston for their big three, KD and James Harden, and not in Brooklyn, but things changed, and then Kyrie went to Brooklyn, and then he called up James Harden and Kyrie and was like, hang on, we're actually going to Brooklyn and not Boston. I mean, Kyrie would kind of seem like the guy that would go somewhere that previous had a big three and would want to kind of develop his own big three to kind of be in the spotlight a little bit more. I wouldn't put it past him. But when we look at what Kyrie Irving did in the Celtics his two years there, let's go to the year before when they had Isaiah Thomas. They were 53, 53 wins and 29 losses, and they lost in the Eastern Conference Finals. Then Kyrie Irving comes his first year. They are only elevated by two more wins, so they go from 53 wins without Kyrie Irving to 55 wins, so they went 55 and 27 that season. Once again, lost in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, you know, Kyrie Irving, he only attributed to, to two more wins, but then they still lose in the Eastern 
Eastern Conference Finals couldn't elevate them to get to the finals. And then his next year, his second year, their loss, their wins went down to 49. So they went 49 and 33, lost in the Eastern Conference semifinals that season. So, you know, it's not like Kyrie Irving was absolutely fantastic and, you know, he was the one that was leading this team. It's it, no, 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 it was nothing really like that. It was Jason, you know, Jason Tatum and company like that. It wasn't really Kyrie Irving elevating anybody. He was really doing the same thing Isaiah Thomas was doing that season in 2016, 2017. So I really don't get this narrative that Kyrie Irving was making the Celtics so much better. And then the year after Kyrie Irving, when they got rid of him, they went 48 and 24. So kind of the same record as, you know, Kyrie Irving's second year last year. And then they got back to the finals. So they got back to the finals without Kyrie Irving in four seasons. In a four-season stretch, two of them with Kyrie Irving, two of them without Kyrie Irving, they get to the finals two times or three times. One of those times with, with was with Kyrie Irving. Two of those times were with not Kyrie Irving. So I don't get this narrative that Kyrie Irving was the end-all, be-all there in Boston. He wasn't elevating anybody else's play. His attitude, his body language was still very, very lackluster. He wasn't kind of incorporating himself into the team. He was above everybody on the floor every single night. I mean, we saw that from him in his body language. So I don't get all this narrative that Kyrie Irving was so great for the Celtics team. I didn't see it live. Like when he first got traded there, I was like, I don't really see it then the second year came and I was like yeah I still don't really see it y'all but everybody wants to hang on that you know Kyrie Irving elevated the Celtics team it was so good for the Celtics like I said the only thing that maybe makes sense of what this uh, Celtics CEO is saying is that you know maybe he would be able to attract more free agents but I think Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can do that themselves I don't think they need really Kyrie Irving to do that so um, I just don't agree. I just don't agree with this kind of Kyrie Irving in the Celtics narrative. I don't think it was anything great. I don't think it was anything special. They did fine with them. They did fine without them. Really nothing changed there. I mean, we're talking about two, three, maybe more wins with Kyrie Irving in totality, but it's not even that much because, you know, they, he won two more games with them and then lost three games without them when we compare it to the 2016 season. So, and the 20, uh, the 2018 season where or the 2019 season where they lost one more game without Kyrie Irving, it's just not that much of an impact. So, Alrighty, and then the last one to do, here it is, Devin Booker finally getting in. He was a big snub. It was all over Twitter. Everybody was outraged. Everybody wanted the mob that Devin Booker was not voted an all-star or a reserve. It was kind of crazy, and I understand it. They kind of chose uh, Chris Paul over Devin Booker, which I've I've got no problem with. They're both great. They're both elevating their play. They're both, they both kind of deserved an all-star spot, kind of like Rudy Gobert and uh, Donovan Mitchell. They both just work together, Chris Paul and Devin Booker. So Devin Booker is going to be in the all-star game because he is replacing Anthony Davis. So, hey, at least he's in here, not voted in, but hey, he got in there just kind of, you know, a reserve for somebody that wasn't going to be healthy. We all know Anthony Davis isn't even playing. He's going to be out for a little bit. So Devin Booker back in the all-star game or in the all-star game. I think this is his first time time in here. Uh, so very well done. Truly deserved a fantastic season. The Suns team is absolutely on a roll and they're getting it done thanks to this man right here, Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton. So definitely well deserved. Devin Booker is going to be in the big game, folks. Alrighty, those are all the stories we needed to cover for today. So let's head over to the NBA. We'll quickly break down what happened last night. Then we'll go a little bit deeper into the stats. Then we'll do our moneymaker for today. Then we'll do our NBA player spotlight. Then we'll do our NFL draft prospect of the day. Alrighty, so let's go over these games. And yesterday we had our money maker extravaganza going. We picked every single game to prove a point that we would call every single game correct except for one. It doesn't matter how many games we call here. We will only miss one game. When we pick four, we hit three. When we hit when we pick three, we hit two. When we pick when we pick two, we hit one. So we went and picked nine yesterday, and guess how many we hit, folks? seven seven out of nine really kind of so seven of nine officially seven of eight unofficially and we'll tell you why so let's go through them here Warriors Pacers first games up we called this one perfectly Warriors plus two we like them straight up we know this Pacers team really doesn't challenge the above average teams very well that's why they're 15 to 15 they haven't been beating the best team so we chose the Warriors got the two points they went out right didn't even need that safety blanket of two points bingo bango Warriors win 111 107. 
All right, this is kind of the game that really we're going to say is unofficially called here. Celtics, Hawks. We chose Celtics minus two, but we chose that because when we were talking about this game on the show, we saw Kemba Walker was playing. Now, fast forward to about, you know, two hours before tip-off, Kemba Walker wasn't playing. He was out. So if we had that information, we would have chosen the Hawks here plus two points. So we're going to count this one unofficially here. We're kind of not going to count this one in our moneymaker because, you know, we were kind of fed false information while we were doing it. So th we did miss on this game. We're not going to count it officially. So let's move on here. So we'll say one of one officially or unofficially. I guess we should call it unofficially. One of one unofficially so far. Then we get the Cavs and the Rockets. And this one's easy money. Easy. I mean, the Rockets are absolutely trash. I mean, yeah, Victor Oladipo played. We didn't care if he did or not because they don't have Christian Wood and they don't have DeMarcus Cousins. So what are we doing here? They've got no big. Jared Allen had a pretty freaking great game like always. So we chose Cavs plus three and a half. They absolutely went out right. They win by four. 16 points, 112, 96 over the Rockets. We had an extra plus three and a half on top of that. Bingo, bingo, easy money. Then we go to Raptors and Heat. Once again, we went with the Heat minus two here. They win by eight. Bingo, bango, three of three unofficially so far. We can't trust this Raptors team just quite yet. Goran Dragic plays for the Heat. That's what we're talking about. We saw Goran Dragic back, able to play. We chose the Heat. They win by eight. Yes, sir. Uh, minus the two, they still win four or three of three unofficially. Then we go to the Bulls and the Timberwolves. Once again, we can trust Zach Levine against a lackluster team against the Timberwolves, and Zach, that's exactly what happens. Zach Levine goes off for 35 points. We called this one Bulls minus four, and they win by seven. Once again, bingo, bango, four of four unofficially here. We can trust the Bulls against lackluster teams. Then we go to Pelicans and Pistons. We chose it. Pelicans minus nine and a half. They win by ten. Yes, sir. Bingo, bango, unofficially five of five. Pelicans, we can trust them once again, kind of against lackluster teams. They haven't been beating the best teams yet, but this Pistons team is nowhere clear, the, nowhere near the best team. So we felt confident in swallowing kind of the nine and a half, ten points. They win by ten. Bingo, bango, another hitter. Then we go to the Spurs and the Thunder. The Spurs were resting everybody. They haven't played in 10 days because of all their games being postponed and suspended because of COVID outbreak. So we went ahead and chose the Thunder minus one. They win by three. Bingo, bango, unofficially six for six. I mean, we can trust this Thunder team. Um decently not too much I mean the reason why we chose the Thunder was because the Spurs were missing so many players I mean and they still almost won so we got to shout out the Spurs but we called this one right Thunder minus one Shea Gilles Alexander gets it done Lugan Stortz with the game winning three-pointer yes sir can finally count on that man so once again six of six six of six unofficially now this is where we officially kind of lose our one pick we had all the information in this game Hornet Suns we went and picked the Suns minus 10 and the Hornets win actually straight up 124 110 or 121 so they win by three we took the suns minus 10 this is the one that we were wrong on now shout out to the hornets for beating the suns team absolutely fantastic i mean what this suns what this hornets team can do they can compete every single game and so that's why we love them we love lamella ball Gordon Hayward's usually pretty good here. Malik Monk had a good game for the Hornets, and it just didn't get it done for the Suns. So this was the one game we were wrong on. Unfortunate Suns minus 10. They don't even win. Unfortunate there. So six of seven unofficially, and that brings us to the last game of the night, Lakers-Jazz. And once again, easy money here. Jazz minus nine. They absolutely blow out the Lakers, 114 to 89. Multiple point win. What is this, 20-something? 20 20-25? 20, 25 25 sounds right so 25 point win for the lakers we had them jazz minus nine or 25 point win for the jazz we had them minus nine easy money there once again no ad no dennis schroeder i mean we're never taking the lakers with any type of points i don't care if you give me 20 points i still won't take that so once again i mean folks we just can't close it out we just can't close it out we're not clutch we're not te we're we're being like teddy bridgewater this season in the nfl we just can't close out games close out half so we know picks we know great value when we see them we just went seven of eight officially seven of nine unofficially in nine straight games all of last night so you got to give us you know our due a little bit it's still frustrating obviously we want to hit all 
all of them. I mean, that's what we strive for every single day. But, you know, our method has purpose. Going through these stats every day has purpose. We know great value when we see it. We can call really the majority of the games and have a winning record when we pick all the games. We just can't get that final one. We can't get that fourth one, that third one. And, you know, it just it just sucks. But we, we try and thrive every day. We're going to go back again today, try to get a moneymaker back on track. Let's see some great value. Do we to, do we take every single game again? Why not? Maybe. We'll see. We'll see if we get great value. But uh, 7 of 8 unofficially, 7 of 9 unofficially uh, last night. I would say that's pretty well done. All right, let's go into the stats a little bit deeper here. Uh, we'll start back at the top, Warriors and the Pacers. Let's start here with the game-winning Warriors team. Steph Curry goes 24 points and only hit one three. One of 11 from three, and they still get the win. So very well done. So Steph Curry, 24 points, eight assists, eight rebounds, two steals, getting it all done. If he's not hitting the threes, he's everywhere else. Assisting, rebounding, stealing, great defense, and that's what makes Steph Curry so great. He's not a one-trick pony. He's the true heart and blood and soul of this team, and we see that really every single night so shout out to Steph Curry pretty good game besides the three-point shooting Kelly Oubre Jr. 17 points, 5 rebounds, 1 of 4 from 3, shot 46% overall, not too bad. Kevin Looney still in the starting lineup here, 4 points, 5 rebounds on 50% shooting, only played 17 minutes. Draymond Green back at the 4 here, 12 points, 11 assists, 9 rebounds, 3 steals, 1 block, absolutely fantastic. Only took 5 shots, shot 4 or 5, that's where the 12 points come from and that's what we know Draymond Green is. He's not the scorer, he's just primarily defense and another floor jump general kind of what Steph Curry is so a great big floor general Draymond Green brings it every single night and then once again we get solid contribution from Andrew Wiggins 15 points four assists two steals didn't shoot the best 38 percent he definitely got to work on the shooting percentage a little bit but we know he can still put up the 15 plus points we get de decent other stats with rebounds and assisting as well he shot 0 of 4 so, so not the best night by him but the Warriors do squeak away with a win none nonetheless <clears throat> Now, James Wiseman back off the bench had a pretty good night here. 11 points, 5 rebounds in 18 minutes. So Kevin Looney and uh, James Wiseman are kind of splitting minutes here. And then we got uh, Eric Poshkel off the bench putting up 13 points. So once again, not bad. Solid contribution from the bench. Decent contribution from the starters and are able to beat the Pacers. Now let's go to the Pacers. Now who did not step up? We see Justin Holiday right off the rip. Only six points, two rebounds, two assists on 28% shooting. So not the best there. Everybody else did pretty solid, kind of comparable to what the Warriors did on their kind of starting roster. Malcolm Brogdon, 24 points, three assists, three rebounds, shooting uh, 50%. 0-4 from three. Miles Turner, 14 points, eight rebounds. So, I mean, he didn't shoot well, four of 13. So the beef down low of Draymond Green, Kevon Looney, and James Wiseman were kind of locking up the big of Miles Turner for the Pacers. So well done there. DeBontis Sabonis, once again, a fantastic game. He's basically like Luka Doncic. He will do pretty much everything, points, rebounds, assisting, great percentage shooting. He carries the team most nights, and he kind of did that here. 22 points, 16 rebounds, four assists, two steals, one block. Not bad, but he did have six turnovers, so a little bit lot there. But he did shoot 58%. Not terrible. And then Doug McDermott, 15 points, three assists, three rebounds on 45% shooting. Uh, decent contribution from the bench. We got two players with nine points. TJ McConnell, nine points, six assists, five rebounds in 27 minutes. Not too bad there. And then Jeremy Lamb, nine points in 19 minutes. So not terrible off the bench. Just, you know, you got Curry. You got some better closers. And we know this Pacers team, they don't have a great big and they don't have a great closer. And that's why they're kind of lackluster. That's why we never really talk about them as one of the top elite teams. They're 15 and 15, middle of the, middle of the road team. Really haven't seen them beat or elevate their play again the best teams in the league so once again we still don't have any stock in this Pacers team can't even beat the Warriors at home this is a team that they should be able to beat I mean yeah the Warriors are you know not great or I don't think they have a chance at winning a title this year they can be competitive maybe win the first round of their playoffs but can't really see this team making a deep run unless Steph Curry just goes absolutely manic and just goes absolutely crazy for seven straight games in a row, 14 straight games in a row, 21 straight games in a row to get to the finals. But we'll see if he can do that. We know he can do that. He's got the ability to do that. It's just will he be able to do that and will the other step up as well? But uh, yeah, this Pacers team just very, very lackluster, but very well done to the Warriors getting the win.
Alrighty, let's go to Celtics and Hawks now. We'll start here with the Hawks. And yes, sir, Trey Young is back on his bullshit. Love it. 33 points, 7 assists, 4 rebounds on 52% shooting, 5 of 11 from 3. Once again, not bad. And he only got to the line 5 times. That's kind of like the one knock I see on Trey Young is that he goes to the free throw line too much. What, what are we talking about? We praise James Harden for doing that, but we clown Trey Young. What are we doing here? So Trey Young's fantastic. We love Trey Young. Um,. I would I will become a Trey Young fan account. I'm sure at one point we'll change this name of the show to Takes by Young, I'm sure at some point. But Trey Young's absolutely fantastic and he had a pretty great game. Clint Capella, a little light, only nine points, but he did have nine rebounds. Shot 50% from the field. Um and just had a pretty decent defensive night. We see he was a plus thirteen. So not bad by him. Uh, what else do we get? To John Collins, 14 points, 11 rebounds. Very well done. Tony Snell, 12 points, 4 assists, 4 rebounds on 50% shooting and 4 of 6 from 3. That's what we're talking about. Um, and then we had a huge contribution off the bench. Actually, the leading scorer for the Hawks, Danilo Gallinari. That's what we love. This is what this man can do. Honestly, maybe this man should be in the starting lineup. I don't really know. You, probably have to, you, you would probably have to put him at the 2 probably um, and then ha have, have Kevin Huter come off the bench because, once again, we don't get a great game by Kevin Huter. When have we ever gotten a great game by Kevin Huter? But uh, 5 points by Kevin Huter, 4 assists, 2 rebounds in 27 minutes, shooting 28%. So maybe get Danilo Gallinari up in the starting lineup. Maybe use him at the 3, the 2. But uh, Danilo, Danilo Gallinari off the bench, 38 points. Six rebounds, two assists, two steals on 81% shooting. 10 of 12 from three, folks. He hit 10 threes himself, and he shot 83% while doing so. Just absolutely wild. And that's why we love this. Or, well, that's kind of a big surprise of this Hawks team. We don't see a lot of great bench play, especially with Daniil Gallinari. We haven't seen anything close to this by him this season. We know he's got the ability to do so. He's kind of, you know, he's got some decent, uh, you know, history in this league. How many seasons in is this man? If it loads. Which it doesn't look like it's doing. So we will not wait for it to load. Here it is. 11 years. Yeah. So he's definitely got, you know, a true veteran in this league. Great night by him off the bench. Very well done. Hawks get the win. Now let's go to the Celtics. Now we obviously don't know Kemba Walker, unfortunately. So now they move Jeff Teague to the one. Jalen Brown to the two. Jason Tatum at the three, Daniel Tice at the four, and Tristan Thompson at the five. So really, their same lineup, just replacing Jeff Teague with Kemba Walker. So Jeff Teague in the starting lineup here, 14 points, five assists, five rebounds on 44% shooting, only 0 of 1 from three. So not bad. He obviously wasn't the best defender. As we see, he was a minus 22 on the floor. So the, uh, the second worst of the team. So not the greatest there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Jeff Teague only taking one three. Absolutely love it. I think that's kind of where Kemba Walker struggles. He's still a solid point guard. He's an above average point guard in this league, but he takes way too many threes, unnecessary shots. He's not the guy here. He is not the guy. He's been in Charlotte his entire career where he was the lone guy, but now he's the third scoring option. Tatum's the one, Brown's the two, Kemba's the three, and he really hasn't even figured out his role here yet, and I think that's kind of the biggest problem of the Celtics team right now. Um, obviously, Marcus Smart being out is a huge kind of blow to them as well because then you have to run freaking Daniel Tyson Tristan Thompson together um so Jalen Brown 17 points five assists four rebounds he definitely could have stepped it up a little bit shot 37 percent I mean Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum they need to start taking over this game they need to demand the ball I uh, doesn't care I don't care what Brad Stevens is barking out there on the court I thought he was a good coach but I mean there's really no reason why they should be struggling you have two great all-stars you have to run the offense through them I don't care who else is on the floor when you have Jason Brown and Jalen Tatum Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown you need to make them work they both need to go for it. It needs to kind of be like a Clipper situation where Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are the only ones like scoring on a nightly basis. They can both drop 25 plus, 30 plus whenever they want. And that's what this team needs to start doing. But Kemba Walker is busy taking 11 threes and hitting like two of them a game. So not great here. So the fact that Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum didn't step up. I mean, Jalen Brown had 17 points. Jason Tatum had 13 points. What are we doing out there? And when Kemba Walker's not there, you have to step it up even more. And they kind of floundered here. So truly disappointing game here by the Celtics that they weren't competitive. This Hawks team isn't anything special. Yes, the Neo Gallinari went off. But besides that, this was a winnable game from them. Nobody else had a great performance besides, you know, Trey Young. 
Alrighty, what else do we get here? Tristan Thompson, pretty decent night by him. 13 points, 13 rebounds, and 8 of those rebounds offensive. I can get behind that. Um, not bad. Daniel Tice only played 11 minutes, 0 points, 0 rebounds, 0 assists, 0 steals, 0 everything. But he only played 11 minutes, but not great. Uh, and then Jason Tatum, I mean, 13 points, one assist, one rebound in 31 minutes, and you shot 20% and one of eight from three. I mean, just a bad game. You you need to be the star. There, uh, Like LeBron James, there's no off days by him. He gives it his all every single game. He doesn't shoot great from three recently, but, I mean, he's the reason why the Lakers are really winning all the games and are competitive without their other bigs in the, in the game. So Jason Tatum, a little disappointed here with this performance. All right, let's quickly go over their bench a little bit. We got two, ooh, three players in double digits. We got uh, Carson Edwards, 11 points. Uh, Aaron Nesmith, 13 points. And Tremont Waters, 11 points. And once again, Taco Fall is, you know, playing seven minutes. So, I don't know, man. Brad Stevens... You've got you've got decent you got decent pieces here. You got two superstars. I'm calling Jalen Brown a superstar. I don't care. I, I'm about this man. I and Jason Tatum. I have absolutely is a superstar. But uh, you've got two great superstars. Uh, the beef, the beef. Daniel Tice, Tristan Thompson, Robert Williams. I mean, it's not great, but when you use them all collectively, you can squeeze a decent performance out every single night. But I don't know, man. The Celtics team, not great. All right, moving on to Rockets and the Cavs, and we got to start with um, Jared Allen because he's going to be our NBA spotlight. Little spoiler here, Jared Allen's our spotlight of the day, and this man, oh man, yes sir. Ooh, I love this man. Yes sir, 26 points, 18 rebounds, two steals on 90% shooting, only missed one shot, one of one from three. Yes sir, absolutely magnificent game. Colin Sexton, 23 points, 3 assists, 2 rebounds on 47% shooting, 3 of 8 from 3. Not bad by him. This is what the offense needs to be. I mean, this is kind of a great game overall by the by this Cavs team. This is what we need to see on a daily basis. Everybody in the starting lineup shooting pretty decently. I mean, um, the lowest uh, per shooting percentage of the starters was 28%, and then the next lowest was 47 So, I mean, there, there were some good scoring performances here in the uh, starting lineup. Everybody was in 10-plus point ten category everybody else you know everybody also was doing kind of other things with the rebounding and assists in the starting lineup as well so very great game by the Cavs beating the Rockets very well done so let's uh, finish out here Darius Garland still still the guard here still the starting guard and that that's definitely a spot that the Cavs can definitely improve on if they get kind of a better point guard, a true number one. So Darius Garland, 11 points, 10 assists. Not bad. Like we said, not bad, but shooting 28%, 3 of 10 from 3. Could be a little bit better. Dean Wade, 11 points, 6 rebounds. And then Isaac Okuru, 10 points, 2 rebounds on 66% shooting. So not bad overall by the starters. And then we get uh, one person in double digits off the bench in Dylan Windler with 13 points. So overall, not bad. And then let's shout out C.D. Osmond, 7 points, 8 rebounds. And JaVale McGee, 4 points, 5 rebounds in only 10 minutes so not not bad overall by this Cavs team would we'll like to start to see them be a little bit more consistent here want to see Jarrett Allen flourish in this system but he has to have you know better pieces around him because I mean you know you can't make too much of an impact as kind of a big as a center you know just ask Giannis the man's playing the four and is kind of struggling to get to the finals or the Eastern Conference finals consistently winning the big games can't make that much of an impact with one lone superstar and let alone a big superstar it doesn't really work once again ask Anthony Davis it doesn't really work too well all right so the Cavs right now are damn they're currently number 14 in the east Currently only three games, though. So three games back, three and a half games back from the eighth seed. So there's still a lot of basketball to be played. We know this, and they can still make a run, and I want to see Jared Allen in the playoffs. So y'all better start making it happen a little bit more. Alrighty, now the Rockets now. Victor Oladipo, John Wall both playing together. Doesn't translate to a win because P.J. Tucker has to play the five. That's not going to get it done. <laughs> They've got no big. They're Look at this. P.J. Tucker's like 6'8". Uh, um, it's like 6'8". What's he officially? 6'5". Six 6'5". Five. Six five, even worse. Even worse. How tall is Deshaun Tate at the 4? 6'4". How tall is Daniel House Jr. at the 3? 6'6". Six six. So they're going ultra small ball like what they did with James Harden. And that doesn't work. If it doesn't work with James Harden, it's definitely going to not work with Victor Oladipo and John Wall together. Because John or James Harden is like both of them combined into one player. So... Very poor night by the Rockets. Poor stretch coming up. 
until Christian Wood gets back, this is going to be a losing team. We've been known this. We've been we've been selling. We've sold. We are tapped out. We are actually negative in our Rocket stock right now because yeah, we've been selling them so much oh, since Christian Wood has gotten injured. So John Wall, twenty points, three assists on thirty eight percent shooting. Victor Oladipo, seventeen points, five assists, six rebounds on forty percent shooting. Then zero points by PJ Tucker. Eight points by Deshaun Tate, seven rebounds along with that. And then 14 points and five rebounds for Daniel House Jr. It's just not going to get it done. This collectively is not going to get it done. They did have decent contribution off the bench by Eric Gordon, who was always kind of, you can always count on him. Um, 17 points, not bad. And then David Waba, 12 points as well off the bench. But very, very lackluster team here in Houston. They had it for a week, and then they lost it. Alrighty, Heat in the Raptors. Let's start here with the game. Winning team Heat. Jimmy Butler, 27 points, 10 assists, 8 rebounds on 47% shooting and 3 of 4 from 3. Look at that man stunt at the 3-point line. Alrighty, we see uh, Goran Dragic. He came off the bench, so Kelly Olenek is still in the starting lineup. This was probably going to be his last game in the starting lineup, I'm assuming. So 7 points, 7 rebounds, 0 of 5 from 3. Classic Kelly Olenek game. He just, he's not a starter, folks. He's truly not a great starter. Bam Adebayo, great game, 19 points, 12 rebounds, 6 of those rebounds offensive. Uh, Duncan Robinson, 17 points, 4 of 9 from 3. Not terrible there. Kendrick Nunn, oof, 7 points, but he did have 7 assists and 4 rebounds, but only shot 22% of 1 of 4 from 3. But Goran Dragic, baby, yes, sir. A little bit of a minutes restriction. We only see him playing 21 minutes off the bench, but he put up 15 points, 3 assists, 2 rebounds, and 2 of 6 from 3. Not the greatest, but we'll give him the 15 points. And that's what we're talking about. Goran Dragic is great, folks. He is kind of, we know they the Heat definitely need Jimmy Butler, and they definitely need Goran Dragic as well so now we can start buying this heat team a little bit more now that Goran Dragic is back in the starting or will be back in the starting lineup um, and then Andre Iguodala what a great game by him 12 points 5 rebounds in 23 minutes off the bench and then look at this Gabe Vincent 11 points in 12 minutes of play not bad so Good overall performance by the Heat. They will get back on track here. And then now the Raptors, a little uh, a little unfortunate. Kyle Lowry back in the starting lineup, finally playing again, and you don't beat the Heat. I mean, you know, we're we're still kind of not figuring, we're not totally sold on this Raptors team just quite yet. And this loss against the Heat, not the best look here. So Kyle Lowry, 24 points, 8 assists, and 7 rebounds. He had a great game, 69% shooting from the field, 4 of 7 from 3. Fred Van Vliet had a great game as well, Pascal, um, for 24 points, 7 assists, and 4 rebounds on 46% shooting, 5 of 11 from 3. Not bad at all. And then Pascal Siakam, once again, still at the 5 here. A little bit of a lackluster game. We haven't really seen him have a poor game at the 5, but here it is. 5 points, 4 assists, and only 2 rebounds on 16% shooting. That is not going to get it done. And that's what we know about this Raptors team. All the starters need to get it done. And Pascal Siakam doesn't, and they kind of lose a, a little bit of a close game. 8-point loss. OG Ananubi, 14.6 rebounds, and then Norman Powell, 17.3 assists. Now, off the bench, they only got one real great contribution in Chris Boucher, 11 points and 6 rebounds in 18 minutes. But, uh, yeah, a little, little light. Uh, Aaron Baines didn't do that great off the bench, 7 points, 4 rebounds in 17 minutes. It's not bad. It's not bad, but definitely could have been a little bit better. Uh, try to make up for the lack of points in production from Pascal Siakam at the 5, but couldn't overcome it. So, he get the win, 116-108. All righty, T-Wolves and the Bulls. Let's start with here with the Bulls. Zach, Mother, Love, and Levine, folks. Six, 35 points, 2 assists, 2 rebounds on 66% shooting. 5 of 8 from 3. Very, very well done. Kobe White, yes, sir. Stringing along some good games together. 20 points, 6 assists, 8 rebounds on 52% shooting. Shot 0 of 6 from 3. So definitely he's got to step that up more. But once again, just kind of great production overall except the 3-point shooting. So we'll take it. Wendell Carter Jr. at the 5, 17 points, 10 rebounds, very well done. Patrick Williams, 13 points, 4 rebounds, 2 assists, and then Garrett Temple, 5 points, 2 assists, 4 rebounds. And how is our 6th man of the year candidate doing? Thaddeus Young off the bench, 14 points, 4 steals, oh my god, 4 steals, 6 assists, 2 rebounds on 50% shooting, yes sir. Woo, we are speaking this into existence, folks. Thaddeus Young, six man of the year candidate. Yes, sir. Fantastic performance here off the bench. Great defense, great offensive production. 28 minutes is a little little lot by him, but hey, you know, still put up 14 points and six assists. So we can get behind that. 
Um, who else do we get here off the bench? Uh, so good. Yeah, some very good contribution off of the bench. Ka uh, Thomas Satorsky. Sadorsky. <laughs> Sadorsky. Uh, 16 points, 4 assists, 5 rebounds. Very, very well done. And then Danzel Valentine, 10 points, 3 assists, 5 rebounds. All right, now this Bulls team, they may have figured it out. What are they on? What's their win streak? 3, and they're now 6 in the East. Yes, sir, they're 7-3 and three in their last 10. B, 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 B. This Bulls team, folks, they are now contenders. I'm putting them in the contenders list. 7-3 and three in their last 10. Kobe White is starting to step it up. We're getting great contribution consistently off this bench now. And Zach Levine is still doing Zach Levine things. So this Bulls team, we've got to start respecting them a little bit more. They've obviously haven't been that great that kind of first third of the season. But this second third of the season, they're really kind of figuring it all out. They are a rising team. So love this Bulls team now. They are a rising team. Who is the rising team in the West? Who is that? Uh, Blazer? Was it the Blazers? Hmm... Hmm. We, we were talking about another team that was doing good that oh the Wizards a little bit six and four so some decent teams here in the second third stepping it up and this Bulls team is one of them we got to start respecting them a little bit more and we will start respecting them hey I might put them hey we got power rankings coming up on tomorrow's show I'll, I'll put them at number 10 I will put them at number 10 yes sir great performance here what very well done very well done yes sir all right let's move on and talk about the Timberwolves now Carl Anthony Towns, 24 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists. Malik Beasley, 25 points. Very well done. Ricky Rubio, 9 points, 10 assists. So not bad by him. Only taking 6 shots, so the 9 points isn't too bad there. Jared Vanderbilt, 16 points, 6 rebounds. Anthony Edwards, 21 points, 6 assists, 9 rebounds, 2 steals. He didn't shoot well, 35% from the field. But, I mean, this is kind of great contribution from all the starters. And they got 2 players off the bench in double-digit scoring. Jalen Noel, 12 points, 3 rebounds, and then Naz Reed, 13 points and 4 rebounds. So, not bad here. Very close game. What do we say? A 7-point win for the Bulls. But, yeah, I mean, this Timberwolves team, they're always competitive. So, we still like this Timberwolves team. Definitely got to see D-Lo back, but we know that's not going to happen for a very long time because he's going to be out for more time unfortunately but uh man they've got the, they, they're decent folks they're decent next year possibly maybe they'll be good maybe <laughs> maybe at the back half of the season maybe the back third of the season the Timberwolves will finally be able to get it figured out with the low back but uh they're rising folks they're getting it done Alrighty, Pelicans and Pistons let's, uh, let's see what was going on with the Pelicans last night here we go Lonzo Ball, 12 points, 8 assists, 6 rebounds on 50% shooting. That's what we're talking about. Contain the shooting a little bit more. Just be the facilitator. Let Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson get the points because they did it last night. Eric Bledsoe, 11 points, 3 rebounds, 2 assists on 45% shooting. Not not bad, not too bad. Steven Adams had a great game, 14 points, 15 rebounds, 6 of those offensive rebounds. Zion Williamson, all-star selection here, 32 points, 5 assists, 6 rebounds on 72% shooting. I'm so impressed by this man's shooting percentage every single time we see it. Very well done. And then Brandon Ingram doing his own thing here, 27 points, 8 assists, 7 rebounds on 50% shooting from the field and the three. Very well done. And then they even got Josh Hart coming off the bench with 11 points. Yes, sir. No Jackson Hayes didn't even play at all. So once they get Jackson Hayes elevated into a kind of a consistent role, either off the bench or in the starting lineup, mostly off the bench because there's really no room for him in the starting lineup. But if they can get this man on track, this is going to be a dangerous Pelicans team, truly. So a nice win here, beating the Pistons. Let's see how our kind of stars are doing here for Detroit. We'll start here with Sadiq Bay. 13 points, 2 rebounds on 50% shooting. Not the greatest. Dennis Smith Schuster, or Dennis Smith Jr., 11.7 assists. Mason Plumley, 21 points, 9 rebounds. Mm, yeah, just not the best. We obviously see no um who's their main guy here. Uh their main guy, Jer uh, Jeremy Grant, Jeremiah Grant. Uh, yeah, he did not play this game, so, I mean, that's why we kind of stayed away from the Pistons, and uh, that's why they lose. They lose by 10. 
All righty, Spurs and the Thunder, and we got to start with this game-winning buzzer beater by Lugan Store. Yes, sir, here we go, tied at 99. Well, before this play, the Spurs had possession, but Patty Mills double dribbled at 99-99 with four seconds left. Double dribbles, turns over the ball to the Thunder. They inbound half court. Lugan Store is wide open, corner three, and he drills. Yes, sir, the buzzer beater for the three-point win and are able to beat the Spurs. So, very well done to the Thunder. They kind of clawed back into this game in the third quarter and then in the fourth quarter, they got the last shot and they win the game. But, let's shout out Shea Gills Alexander. A fantastic game. 42 points, 4 assists, 8 rebounds on 65% shooting. Got to the line 11 times as well. Al Horford, 16 points, 7 rebounds, 7 assists. Darius Baisley, no points, but 10 rebounds, 0 of 8 from the field, and still got it and still ended up winning the game because Lou Gensdor, yes, sir, 16 points, 4 rebounds, shot 4 of 7 from 3. 50% overall from the field, and that's how it is. Shea Gills Alexander taking control, scoring 42 huge points, and then Lugan Stort stepping it up. This is the first time that we've really seen Lugan Stort this season step it up, hit the game winning buzzer beater, and just kind of win the game for the squad. So uh, we'll see if the Thunder can keep up this level of play. I don't think they can. I, I kind of think this is a outlier game by Shea Gillis Alexander. Really don't see him, you know, doing anything close, like even 30 plus points every single game. But um, great performance, and we're not going to knock it. Alrighty, and then the Spurs now, obviously no DeMar DeRozan, no Derek White. I think they were missing somebody else that isn't uh, no... Um, DeMar DeRozan and Rudy Gay. So uh, some notable names out here, and they still almost won the game. I mean, they were competitive all throughout. They had the lead basically the entire game until late the third quarter, uh, and then they were still in it in the fourth quarter. So DeJounte Murray, 27 points, 6 assists, 9 rebounds on 60% shooting. Lonnie Walker, 12 points, 4 rebounds, 31% shooting, not the greatest. Jacob Podol at the 5, 7 points, 9 rebounds. Trey Lyles, 8 points, 5 rebounds. And then Luka Semanic, 4 points, 4 Four rebounds on 66% shooting. So, I mean, shooting numbers weren't terrible. Decent production off the, uh, off the starters. Uh, Patty Mills off the bench, 15 points. He had kind of a costly turnover, kind of game-costing turnover. They would have had a chance to kind of win the game in regulation or go to overtime because, you know, the shot clock was turned off. But Patty Mills steps out of bounds. Truly unfortunate. And then LaMarcus Aldridge off the bench, 11 points and 7 rebounds. So, Thunder get the win, 102-99. Alrighty, Suns and the Hornets now. Very well done to the Hornets. LaMelo, mother loving ball. Yes, sir. 20 points, 8 assists, 2 steals, 4 rebounds on 63% shooting. Terry Rougier, only 10 points, and they still get the win. So, hey, we'll take it. He didn't shoot well, 27%, but he still put up 10 points, 4 assists, 6 rebounds. Cody Zeller, 10 points, 4 rebounds, 55% shooting, minus 4, and a win. Mm, I mean, when you got DeAndre Ayton over Cody Zeller, I think we take, I think we take uh, DeAndre Ayton. Uh, P.J. Washington, 10 points, 1 rebound. Gordon Hayward, 20 points, 8 rebounds on 41% shooting, but 0 of 5 from 3. That's got to be a little bit better. So, LaMelo Ball, um, kind of the best performance of the starters. So, love seeing that. But they did get great contribution from the bench. Miles Bridges, 14 points, 6 rebounds. And Malik Monk, 29 points, 3 assists, 2 rebounds. And this shouldn't surprise us because, you know, this is what Malik Monk and Miles Bridges were doing when LaMelo Ball was on the bench, helping them out, being the facilitator to the two great scorers. So, great job here by these two bench players to get it done for the bench. And let's shout out Bismick Biombo because he had three points and 11 rebounds in 26 minutes off the bench. So I'll give him that as well. So kind of a decent night here by everybody by the Hornets. Love seeing that. Love seeing the bench step up. Now let's see why the Suns lost. Here we go. Chris Paul, 20 points, 10 assists, 8 rebounds on 50% shooting. That's kind of a classic game by him. Devin Booker, 33 points, 3 assists, no rebounds. Shot 54%, 4 of 10 from 3. So once again, not bad. This is kind of a classic Devin Booker game. Yes, the rebounds are a little light, but the points are there. DeAndre Ayton, 16 points, 10 rebounds. Once again, pretty solid game. Frank Kaminsky, 6 points, 3 rebounds. McCall Bridges, 12 points, 4 rebounds. Not too bad there. And then they got a decent contribution off the bench. Jay Crowder, 12 points, 5 rebounds. 
and Cameron Johnson, 14 points, but that was really it. No great game by Dario Saric, only 6 points, only 15 minutes, but still. And then Cameron Payne, only 10, 10 minutes and 2 points. So not great depth by this Suns team this game. No great real help. It's just uh, Malik Monk had a little bit of a better game off the bench than uh, the Suns players did, unfortunately. And then that brings us to the last game of the night, the Jazz and the Lakers. Let's quickly go through this because the Lakers were non-competitive. We knew they would be non-competitive, and that's what happened. So Mike Connolly, 14 points, 8 assists, 8 rebounds. Donovan Mitchell, 13 points. I mean, Donovan Mitchell scores 13 points and still blows your team out. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So 13, 13 points. The leading score was 18 points. Two, two people had 18 points, but still, I mean, the Lakers, oof, man. Without AD and Dennis Schroeder, that team, man, oof, nothing great. Donovan Mitchell, 13 points, 8 assists, 10 rebounds. Rudy Gobert, 18 points, 9 rebounds. Royce O'Neal, 6 points, 4 rebounds. Bo Bojan Bogdanovic, 15 points, 2 steals, 2 assists, 2 rebounds on 50% shooting and 5 of 8 from 3. Very well done. And then off the bench, Derek Favors, 12 points. And Jordan Clarkson, 6th man of the year candidate there, 18 points. No surprise there. So, Yes, sir. The Jazz are good and they are deep. Now the Lakers, they are not good and not deep without AD and Dennis Schroeder. So LeBron James, I mean, he only played 27 minutes, kind of, you know, gave up in the fourth quarter when the game was over. Can you blame him? I mean, he's in his 30s. He's 36. I mean, they, they've got no chance of winning. If nobody's going to step up, why is he should be out there? So 19 points, leading score for the squad, four assists, four rebounds, four turnovers as well, one of five from three. This month has not been great by LeBron James shooting the three. This is kind of a really bad month. He's hitting like one out of six, one out of eight this entire month. So not a great month by him. Markeith Morris gets the starting position at the four, 12 points, nine rebounds on 50% shooting. Not bad there. Marcus All, eight points, two rebounds. KCP, five points, three rebounds on 20% shooting. Taylor Horton Tucker, eight points, five assists on 25% shooting. It's just like, can somebody step up? Kyle Kuzma goes off the bench and doesn't step up. He only can work at the four when AD is not there. Kyle Kuzma off the bench, five points. He did have seven rebounds, so I'll give him that, but five points on 28% shooting. And then Alex Caruso, three points on 12% shooting. Manchas Harold, the Sixth man of the year candidate, yes, sir, in 22 minutes of play, 16.6 rebounds on 58% shooting. That's what I'm talking about. You need to get Montrezl Harold in the starting lineup. You cannot use him off the bench when there's no AD because you're going to get down and then LeBron's going to quit and everybody's going to quit and it's going to be over. So I, I don't know. The starting lineup should probably be LeBron. Le all right, so it should probably definitely should be Taylor Horton Tucker at the one, KCP at the two. LeBron James at the three, Kyle Kuzma at the four, and then Montrose Harold at the five. Maybe put Alex Caruso at the one, see if he can kind of, you know, replicate what he did last year. Last year. Taitlin Horton Tucker is the new Alex Caruso from last year, so they're trying to make him work, but there's just nobody else stepping up on this team, and it is truly unfortunate because, you know, LeBron James, he's trying his best out here, just can't get the dubs because nobody steps up. Alrighty, that was the NBA from last night. Let's see what's on deck today. We got primetime games on television. Yes, sir. Maverick 76 or 7 o'clock on TNT should be a great one. Nets Magic, Knicks Kings, Grizzlies Clippers. That should be interesting to watch. Don't think the Grizzlies will win, but let's see if they can start beating some of these top tier teams consistently. Nuggets, Wizards, once again, probably an easy game for the Nuggets. And then on 9.30 on TNT, doubleheader, primetime games, Bucks, Pelicans. Let's see if the Pelicans can go for two in a row here over the Bucks and extend their streak a little bit. Alrighty, let's do our moneymaker today. We hit to 7 of 8 unofficially, 7 of 9 officially from last night. I mean, folks, we know value when we see it. So let's try and get some good value. Let's hit a freaking parley here tonight. Let's get it done. Here we go. What's the value? Let's find it. Here we go. Mavericks, 76ers. 76ers minus 4.5. Mavericks plus 4.5. I'm assuming... I'm assuming... 
Uh, let's get to the uh, let's get to the ins and outs. I'm assuming Krista Porzingis is not playing. Let's see what his game status is. Game time decision. All right, all right. And then Seth Curry game time decision for the 76 or so. Yeah, the Mavericks. You know they're getting a little lucky here, winning kind of. You know at the buzzer. We just saw Doncic hit the game winner. But 76ers at home on TV. Everybody's ready to rock. Ben Sim or uh, not Ben Simmons. Well, Ben Simmons is healthy, so that's great. Uh, great defensive piece. But um, who's gonna stop Embiid? I don't even think. Chris that Porzingis can do it himself. So we'll, we'll take the minus four and a half here for the 76ers. Uh, Magic, Nets, Nets minus eight and a half. Obviously a solid pick there. Uh, let's make sure everybody's good to go for the Nets. Um, Aaron Gordon obviously out for the Magic. We know that. And uh, Kevin Durant still out. Jeff Green, game time decision. And Landry Shamet, game time decision. And TLC, Timothy Luawe Cabaret, game time decision. But Kyrie, James Harden are both playing. Don't want to swallow eight, so we'll come back to this one if we don't get any great value anywhere else. Kings, Knicks. Knicks minus two against the Kings. Yes, we're going to take this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as everybody's good to go for the Knicks. I mean, we know this Kings team is sliding. They haven't really been great in the last two weeks. They've really lost all their magic, as we've said. No Hassan Whiteside for the Kings. A huge out for them. Alfred Payton, game time decision. Nerlens no game time decision. That's all fine. As, our, as long as, you know, RJ Barrett and... Um, uh, Julius Randle are playing for the starters and all the bench are there. Uh, quickly, Toppin, Gibson, D Rose. We're going to take it and we only have to swallow two here. Yeah, so Knicks minus two. That's some great value. Love it. At home, especially. Yes, sir. Alrighty, Clippers, Grizzlies. Clippers minus eight. Grizzlies plus eight. Um, if no Kawhi, no Paul George, Grizzlies plus eight is looking s decent, but I'm sure they're playing. Yes, sir. They've taken a couple of games off and still. Dylan Brooks is a game time decision. So until he comes back, we have to stay away from the Grizzlies and don't want to swallow eight there with the Clippers because we already got great value on these other two games. So no need to squeeze those in there. Wizards, Nuggets, Nuggets minus seven, Wizards plus seven. All righty. Um, Denver, you know, we know they're missing a couple of players recently. Paul Millsap, let's see if they're all good to go. Paul Millsap is still out. Gary Harris out. P.J. Dozier out. Drew Michael Green out. So, yes, we still have to stay away from the Nuggets, um, even though they're kind of favored here. And the Wizards, Davis Burton, he's a game-time decision who's kind of their other big three. We get, obviously, Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook going great every single game. But Devin Burton is kind of the unsung hero of the squad. Uh, so him being a game-time decision... Uh, we're going to stay away from Wizards plus seven. It is, I, I think I would lean towards Wizards plus seven if we have to take this game um, because they are kind of trending up and, you know, kind of those other supporting casts, those other kind of, uh, you know, the, the three, the four of the Nuggets team are going to be out officially. So we're going to stay away from this one. Not great value, not totally great value. Wizards plus seven is decent value, but uh, we got two other ga great games here, so let's not push it. Let's get back on track here. And then the last game of the night, Pelicans plus nine over the Bucks. Mm. Woo! All right, Pelicans, they are on a back-to-back, -back, which is not great, which is not great. Drew Holiday, game-time decision. Bobby Portis, game-time decision. Jalen Adams, game-time decision. Now, how are the Pelicans going to be able to handle the beef of just everybody on that Bucks team. Man, I mean, a nine there for the Pelicans. That's pretty dang good, folks. The only reason why I would probably stay away from it is because they are on a back-to-back. -back. But, I mean, look at the performance. I mean, everybody really did good. Everybody did good in the starting lineup, so... Ah, uh, let's push it a little bit here. Let's get it a three-teamer officially here. We'll take the Pelicans plus the points here. We can never trust the Bucks, so we'll t I think that's some decent value there with Pelicans plus nine. So this is what we got today. 76ers minus four and a half. Knicks minus two. Pelicans plus nine. Let's get back on track and let's hit. Let's find that last game. Let's solidify that last game and not go three of four and uh, two of three and one of two and freaking seven of eight. Can we can we finally hit three of three? Can we hit 100 percent and not 75 or 80 or 95? So here we go. There it is. 76ers minus four and a half. Knicks minus two. Pelicans plus nine. Alrighty, let's switch over to our uh, main topics of today. And the first one up is our NBA player spotlight. And the NBA player spotlight of today is my man, Jared Allen. Little bit of an all-star snub. 
All-star snub. We voted that man an all-star starter. We love what this man's doing. Just hasn't been consistently starting. Started with the Nets this season and then got traded because of that whole thing, that whole James Harden trade. So he goes to the Cavs, starts on the bench, and then they are going to trade Andre Drummond. So he gets elevated to the starting position, and he's absolutely killing it. He was killing it on the bench with the Cavs too. Don't get us wrong. Absolutely fantastic. Um, let's let's uh, remind what these all-star reserves are. Or, uh, yeah, right here. In the East, Harden. Obviously, I put Harden over... Um, Jared Allen, Julius Randle. I think he deserves it. I wouldn't, you know, swap out Julius Randle's spot for Jared Allen. Jason Tatum definitely deserved. Jalen Brown deserved, but you know, two players on the same team of Jason Brown, of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Zach Levine definitely deserved. Ben Simmons definitely deserved. Vucevic, I would probably put joke, or I would probably put Jared Allen over Vucevic. Um, Vucevic, I mean, he doesn't play well with Aaron Gordon, and they've been floundering, and he just started to come into his own. Where Jared Allen's been fantastic all season. So, a little bit of an all-star snub. I think we could have gotten Jared Allen on there, probably substituting Vucevic. Uh, but back to Jared Allen here. Here he is. I mean, these are his season stats. Thir averaging 13 points, 9 rebounds, and 1 assist. Better than all of his career averages. 10 points averages. Uh, so, in his career, 10 points. Eight rebounds and one assist. That's what he's averaging. And then this season, 13 points, nine rebounds, and one assist. But let's get a little bit deeper. Let's watch this man when he's actually a starter. And let's see what he's averaging when he's an actual starter. Because as I said, he was coming off the bench early in that Cavs kind of, you know, when he first got there in Cleveland. So as a starter, this man is averaging 16 points. 12 rebounds and two assists a game, folks. I mean, this is great stuff. I mean, great offensive big there for this Cavs team. And he's really kind of, you know, the main scorer. Maybe Colin Sexton, if you want to give him that, that's fine. But Jared Allen, a little bit of a number one on this Cavs team. So great work by him. The stats are all great. Love watching this man play. Want to see him on a good team. Unfortunately, we know that they are trading Andre Drummond, so they're not going to uh, – so they're not going to trade Jared Allen because you're not going to trade away both of your bigs, unfortunately. So Jared Allen is going to be a Cav, probably most likely 99% certain for the rest of the season, unfortunately. And as we said, they're three games out of that eighth spot to currently 14th in the East. So we'd we'll love to see this man try to get into the playoffs. I just want to see him in the playoffs. I want to see him get the recognition, everybody watching him. So very well done to Jared Allen. Stats are great, and we got some highlights of him. So we're going to go from probably his best game of the season against a good opponent. Um, yes, they lost this game kind of bad. I think, I think they lost by like 36 this game. But Jarrett Allen, 20 points, 10 rebounds, and did really kind of good against this Jazz team. So we got highlights from this game. And then if we need to, we got highlights of what he did in Brooklyn this season. So uh, we can kind of look at that because he worked well with Kyrie Irving. And, I mean, if Jarrett Allen was still on that team with uh, – and they traded DeAndre Jordan instead of Jared Allen and kept uh, and ended up still having KD, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving and Jared Allen. I'm talking championship. That's a dynasty. We're talking five straight chips with that. Um, so let's roll this tape here. Let's watch what Jared Allen's doing. Um, he's just super impressive. So here we go. Every possession of Jarrett Allen from that Jazz or from the Nuggets. That's why we chose this game because, you know, Nuggets, you've got, you know, Michael Porter Jr., decent kind of, you know, number three there, decent in size as well. And then going against Jokic, I mean, you know, that's a pretty good big to go against. So here we go. Cleveland, Denver, of uh, February 20th of this season. Is this right? Was it February 20th? Hmm. I thought it was a little, uh, well, let's just double check. Let's just double check. Um, here we go. The 20th, the 19th, the 19th. Here it is. Denver Nuggets, they lose by 17 points. 20 points by Jared Allen. 10 rebounds, 4 assists, 1 steal, 1 block. So hopefully we get to see all of that here in the highlights. So here we go. Jared Allen against the Nuggets just a couple of days ago. Down low in the post. I mean, look at that. Triple team. They're, they've they got him boxed in. And he's still able to rise above, get the re, get the, uh, get the the layup in. And it's over Jokic and you know, Michael Porter Jr. So decent beef there. Here he is at the top of the key. The pick and the roll. And there it is. The floater just going against Jokic. I mean, the pick and roll with Jared Allen's fantastic. He knows how to do it. He knows how to read the play. Here he is again, just kind of at the top. 
One, and then he makes the perfect pass. Yes, sir. He's got great vision, great touch, great handles, especially down low. Just watch his posi positioning down low. When everybody's crashing, he knows. I mean, look at that. Just gets in front of that one defender. Perfect bounce pass inside and then goes up strong with the layup. Just easy right there. And then if you're going to have a small guy try to guard him down low, he's just going to go and dunk on you. One-handed dunk. Easy. Come on. you got to have beef on this man if you want to have a chance to guard him. Here he is at the free throw line. Ooh, all right, all right, gotta work, gotta work out the free throws a little bit. Miss one there, all right. Let's see if he makes the second one. Come on, come on. Cash, yes, sir, all righty. So, you know, the first free throw is always, you know, the hardest one to make. Here he is, back down low. They're going to take a three. I'm guessing he gets this rebound. Yes, sir. Able to kind of box out Jokic and then finds the pass that gets all around. And I'm assuming they make that. I don't know, they cut the highlight short. All right, ball finds its way in the corner. Three-point is no good, and he's able to get it over Michael Porter Jr. this time. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 6'10", 6'9", and he's still – I know Jared Allen's 6'11", but he's still going up and getting it. Corner three is no good once again. Oh, this is the same highlight. So great. You got to see it twice, and there it is, just getting the rebound over freaking Michael Porter Jr. Fantastic. All right, here it is on the defensive end. Nice little defensive rebound. That's easy, but hey, he still got it. <laughs> he still got it. Still his positioning. And then they outlet with the three. No good there. So he's going to go back on defense. All right, I was about to say that highlight was way too long. <laughs> Jerry Allen at the top of the key. How has he run the offense? Well, he's lobbing it. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's stop. That's up there. Jared Allen trying to do too much here. A uh, lob from the three point by Jared Allen. No, you got to be catching those. I don't what are you doing down low there? All right, try to squeeze it in there. I <laughs> try to squeeze it in there a little bit. Back on the defensive end. Couldn't stop that. Unfortunate. All right, here we go. Jared Allen just cutting to the basket. Finds the open three. Is that cash? Yes, sir. Look at the vision by that man. Very well done. All right, defense up on Jokic, and there it is. Look at that. Look at that. Jokic trying to, you know, pass the ball around, and Jared Allen just gets a tip on it, and then they're able to get the possession. So very well done. Guarding Jokic is not an easy feat there, and I know the Nuggets are up big, but Jared Allen, he, you know, he is responsible for, you know, decent success here of the Cavs. They're just very lackluster everywhere else. Even Colin Sexton's really not that consistent. I mean, we see this turnover here trying to force it into J Jared Allen. Unfortunate. Um, so turnover there. Not Jared Allen's fault. Here he is. Gets it. Pick and roll. But he just dumps it off for the three. Very well done. I mean, nice pick there to set up the three. I mean, the man knows how to play offense, folks. He knows it. It's just this Cavs team. They're super young. They've got no superstar. Jared Allen's their lone superstar. All right. He got a little beat here by Jokic. I mean, Jokic's real hard to guard. The only person that can guard him very good is Anthony Davis. Even Rudy Gobert has struggles against Jokic. Draws the foul there on Jokic, unfortunately. Cutting to the basket. One dribble. Three players around him. Ah, oh, comes off the rim. Unfortunate. And I just want to say this. The reason that we don't have highlights of this man, just strict highlights, is because it's hard to get in-season highlights, especially when it's only kind of, you know, we're start, we're almost, you know, midpoint of the season at the All-Star break. So it is hard to find, you know, true highlights. You can only find really game highlights. And I don't want to watch, you know, game by game. I do want to kind of get an entire caps encapsulation of this man. Our camera just died, so no more video for the, for the rest of the episode, unfortunate. Uh, but um, we're still here talking. No worries. You know, you can't can't see us but we're here um but um back to this um you know jared allen we had to kind of you know it's like we said it's tough to find good great clips of what they've done all season so we had to t take you know games into consideration so we chose this game like we said because it was kind of against Jokic, and he still had 20 points and 10 rebounds that's pretty dang good uh so that's why we chose this game in totality but let's go back to the clips here or this game here uh nice easy rebound there nothing special Jared Allen on a messed up play. I mean, this kind of this is a last second pass to him, very behind, and he's still able to kind of grab the ball, continue forward, go and get the bucket, and it looks like he got the end one as well. So yes, sir, if you're putting small bodies on him, he's going to attack the basket, and he drills the free throw this time. Yes, sir, we get another free throw here. Can he hit it again? Yes, sir, a big that can hit the free throws. We're at the line for another time here. Let's see another one. 
Ah, we jinxed him. Darn, darn, darn. What is he? Uh, four of four and two right now. Makes misses, unfortunately. All right, Michael Porter Jr. missed three. Easy rebound there. Just defensive rebound. No worries. Back at the free throw line. Hitting him again. Yes, sir. He'll miss one, but he'll hit, he'll hit the next two and three. No worries there. Back at the free throw line. Back missing. Darn it. We're really, <laughs> we're really jinxing this, man. It even works in freaking games you know the outcome of. Unfortunate. Um, nice steal there. Jared Allen trying to run the break, break here. Two on one. And, hey, doesn't pass it to Jared Allen. Could have. Could have done that. But he t keeps it himself and makes the basket. But well done by Jared Allen to push the ball after the steal. Very well done. Joe kick running point. Great turnover. Jared Allen gets the steal. Now it's three on two. And um, Jared Allen there with the offensive rebound. And he puts it back. Yes, sir. When you've got the numbers, Jared Allen once again down low. And another great steal there. That was like the same play over and over again. This man takes it. Once again, knocks it off. And Jared Allen, the hustle. He could give up. But he sees, hey, instead of having a two on two fast break, let me join you and have a three on two. And there it is. I mean, he could have just drowned out like this man. Watch this man run. And he just kind of stops here well, bullet, well uh, beyond the three-point line. And Jared Allen goes down to the basket because he knows 35 is going to miss it because everybody on the Cavs cannot play besides Jared Allen. So we'll watch it one more time here. Well done. He doesn't get the steal, but he gets the ball after the steal, pushes the ball forward, gets all these offensive rebounds, and then scores the ball because nobody else can. All right, great double there on Murray, forcing a little bit of a bad pass there. Ball finds his way into the corner. Very well done. And then Jared Allen's there for the rebound, the easy rebound. Jared Allen, low post. I mean, come on. Who is this down low? Why? If, if it's not Joe Kick, I don't want to hear it. He's going over everybody, everybody. The man's 6'11". You better respect his height, Joe Kick. You better stick down low when that man is there. All right, bringing the lead down to 16 here, trying to do everything. Jared Allen with the block. He's like, who are you driving on me? Dude, he looks like 5'10 right here. He's like, you got 5'10 on me? Block, block, block. <laughs> Don't try to bring that weak stuff over here. Do you know who I am? I'm Jared Allen, baby. Y'all didn't watch me when I was in Brooklyn before the big three got there because I was still doing work over there. So... Very well done. Big fan of Jared Allen. This highlight tape doesn't really truly do him justice because his team overall is not that great. He's really the high point of the Cavs team. But we love Jared Allen here. We'd wish he would get traded to a kind of a contender this season. Like we said, we don't think that's going to happen. But very well done to Jared Allen, our player spotlight of today. Very well done. Super impressed by what this man is doing. Alrighty, let's go over to our NFL draft prospect of the day. And our hint was he's kind of the forgotten receiver in this draft. Uh, we obviously know Jamar Chase. We know Devontae Smith. But do y'all know this little man? And I do say little because he's not the tallest. But here it is. Wide receiver from Alabama, Jalen Waddle. Waddle. Jalen Waddle, wide receiver, Alabama here. He's only 5'10", folks. So a little bit of Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill's 5'10". Is Tyreek Hill 5'8"? I don't think he's that short. Uh, but uh, Jalen Waddle, 5'10", wide receiver from Alabama. Uh, we'll see if he plays like Tyreek Hill, goes up and gets the ball, or is he just kind of a quick gadget player, gadget wide receiver. So we'll watch the tape and break down the stats to find out. So here we go. In three seasons of Alabama, 2018. He's had 45 catches for 848 yards and seven touchdowns. Then in 2019, 33 receptions, so the targets went down. He only he did play two less games there for 560 yards, six touchdowns. And then in 2020, he missed about a couple of games. He played like the first four games, missed the rest of the season, then came back for the championship game. So in only six games, he had 28 receptions for 591 yards, more yards in less games than he did his sophomore season. And he had four touchdowns to go along with that. So not bad overall here. Obviously, we know he's not even a true number one wide receiver because they got Devontae Smith on that uh, on the same team, 2018, 19, and 20. Devontae Smith was there there all three years and even in 2017 before he even got there. So uh, we know he's got to be splitting some uh, receptions here with Devontae Smith, who's won the Heisman Trophy. So he's kind of the number two wide receiver on this team. But he was still making it work here. Some solid numbers and, you know, kind of, you know, less games as a number two. 
Um, so let's see what he has done in these bowl games. We take bowl games very kind of seriously into kind of our factor if we like a player or not. So we got to go back to his freshman year in 2018. They get to the SEC championship game against Georgia. He had four receptions for 113 yards and one touchdown. Very well done. Then they get into the college football playoffs round one against Oklahoma. Only two receptions for 20 yards, no touchdowns. Then they get to the championship game against Clemson and they lose and they only and he only has two catches for 25 yards. So it doesn't seem like they really go to him in the most biggest games. We're talking about the football playoffs, the football championships, and he only had four catches in both playoff games for 45 yards combined with no touchdowns. So not the greatest there, unfortunately. But that was 2018. Let's see if he steps it up in 2019 if they start to use him a little bit more. So in 2019... Um, it looks like, uh, what, what's up here in 20, uh, what is this? The Citrus Bowl against Michigan. Here we go. So bowl game against Michigan. Once again, only one reception for seven yards. They win the game, but no touchdowns, not using him in the biggest games. And like we said, he is kind of the number two here. So yes, the stats probably aren't going to be the best, but maybe the highlights will change our mind. And then that brings us to this season, 2020. As we said, he played the first couple of games. He played the first one, two, three, four games, got injured the fifth game on a punt return, a kick return, and then he goes down for the rest of the season, but it does play in the championship game. So in the championship, game his first game back and I want to applaud him I mean he could have easily just said nah I like I'm, I'm not gonna play like um, this is a COVID year first of all it's a COVID year second of all I've got injured mid-year third I'm going to go to the draft so I don't want to risk my my risk another injury or a setback that would hurt my draft stock and fourth of all y'all got the Heisman winner do y'all even need me so I do want to give a lot of respect to Jalen Waddle for coming back after the injury and playing in the championship game so very well done to that uh, but once again, they don't really use them a lot here. Three catches for 34 yards and no touchdowns. So great kind of decent seasons all around. And I mean, when we look at what he did in this season, I mean, before he got injured, eight, caption, eight catches, 134 yards, two touchdowns, game one. Game two, five catches for 142 yards, one touchdown. Six catches in game three for 120 yards, no touchdown. And then the fourth game, six catches for 161 yards and one touchdown. So he's picking up like 20, 25 yards a pop, no worries throughout the entire game. So that's all good. But not using them in these bowl games, these championship games, these best, these most important games. And I can understand in 2020 because he wasn't there in the back half of the season. But still, you know, if somebody's good, they're going to get open and they're going to be open. But but um, Alabama still wins. They win the championship game this season. So not bad overall. Not bad overall. So the stats are decent. Nothing great. Nothing to write home about. Just some nice plays in this 2020 season. We love those over 100 yards with like, you know, four or five less catches. So that's always great. So now let's go into the film here. We've got his 2020 highlights here. And then if we need to kind of adjust the speed, we found this highlight package fastest wide receiver in the SEC. So we'll see if we need to watch more film off his speed. If we think he's going to be like a Tyree kill, we can watch that. But if we feel like we're good on just this highlight package alone, that's fine as well. So here we go. 2020 highlights of our NFL draft prospect of the day, Jalen Waddle. Here we go. Oh, let's get his number two just in case. Uh, 17, number 17. All right. Now we can go. Here we go. First play, Mac Jones at the quarterback position. He airs it out. Jalen Watt. Oh, okay. A little bit of a diving catch over a defender. And now we can possibly compare him to Tyreek Hill because this is what Tyreek Hill does. He goes up and gets the ball. He is five, uh, he's 5'10", folks. So he has to go up and get it. And he does go up and get it. Yes, sir. Attacking the ball, high pointing the ball. Knowing he's going to take a big hit, takes two big hits, and still able to cradle that ball down safely for the absolute great catch. Look at that man, fearless. That's what we love to see. If you're a short receiver, that's fine, but you are going to have to go up and get these balls, and he just did it here. So promising sign there. Nice out right there. I mean, this is kind of wide open. He's got a step, maybe even a step and a half on this defender. Let's watch it one more time in slow motion. I mean, this is wide open. That's easy two steps over that defender, and he just beats them all to the end zone. Alrighty, in the red zone here at the 11-yard line. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get him into open space. Oh, yes, sir. Now we're talking about some serious speed here. A little bit of a design delayed pass out of the backfield. And then he's only got one man to beat. Beats him to the corner, stays in bounds, dives to the pylon, and that's a touchdown, baby. He's got some nice speed so far. Let's watch this one more time. Just beat him to the corner, able to stay in bounds, and then that's a touchdown, baby. Yes, sir, all day. All righty. So these first two highlights, we saw him go up and get the ball. We saw him outrun people to the corner. And now we're starting to talk about a decent wide receiver here. Here we go. Just kind of a wide receiver screen. Get this man into space. This, oh, yes, these cuts. Yes, sir. And then he goes down. He dives a little bit there, picking up all he can and making a third and one on a second and 12 play there. So not bad here. Set up wide receiver screen. Makes that man miss. Jukes back inside. Makes that man miss. And then just goes down because he knows he really can't get anything else there. So he's smart with it. Yeah, not taking the big hits. He doesn't want to get hit. Hey, I'm all about that. Get what you can. Obviously, don't try to slide or go down if you feel like you can pick up more yards. Mac Jones. Oh, first of all, beautiful throw. Holy moly. But what a great catch. And he's able to get just like a half a step on these defenders. And that's why it makes this throw so good. He just lays it right out in front. And he goes and tracks the ball right in the back of the end zone, running out of space. This is a fantastic play. I think this is probably a better throw than catch, honestly. We got to give it up for Mac Jones on this toss. What a freaking throw. Holy moly. What a great catch, too. I mean, over the shoulder, looking back, can track the ball, especially with two defenders on him. And he, that's like a that's a nice half a step um, separation between the receiver and the defender. So he does have some speed. He is getting behind the defense, taking the top off the defense. And that's all you want from a nice, fast, wide receiver. Here he gets a nice contested catch. Defender all over him, secures the catch for the first down. Love it. Mac Jones going to go deep to him again. Once again, a great throw and a great catch. The man is 5'8", so he does have to go up and get the ball, and he secures that ball so well. He does go and catch the ball with his hands. I hope we get a slow-mo highlight of this, and we do. Fantastic. Just watch him go, track the ball. I mean, he's jumping in midair to go and grab these balls, and he still has the con concentration to look the ball in and then carry like yards after the catch after going up and getting these balls. It's fantastic work out there. Nice catch here. We can watch this again. What do we got? Just coming over the middle of the field. He is. I mean, if you got a linebacker on him, goodbye, good night, touchdown, game over. You cannot have linebackers on fast wide receivers. Here he is, just gets it out of the backfield, and he just gets out of bounds. I mean, he doesn't take the unnecessary hits, which I'm all about. I've got no problem with that. Get what you can. Get down. Get you know. Get out of bounds. And look at this one. He's able to get behind the defense, and then he he route runs everybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now we're talking about some great Tyreek Hill speed here. Able to get behind the defense. I mean, where is the safety at? Safety. <laughs> Jalen Waddle's like safety. Safeties. No. What are you talking about? I outrun everybody. Back of the defense, top off the defense. That's where I'm going. Great run there. Now we're talking about some great speed. Oh, and Fant whoever created this highlight package, thank you, because I wanted to see how we got behind the defense. We couldn't see it from the first highlight, but then they got this one in here. Very well done. Let's shout this man out. Colton Denning. Follow this man on YouTube. What a great highlight package. Super impressed. All right, here we go. Jalen Waddle just going to run down. Nice little double move, and ooh, once you bite, he that's when he attacks, baby. He's going to plant that foot, cut it right back up down the field, and it's goodbye. Good night. Sayonara. Touchdown, Jalen Waddle. All right, comeback route. All right, all right. Not breaking a lot of tackles here. I mean, he's 5'8". He's 160 pounds. It's not like he's the most uh, beefy player. But a nice kind of setup, kind of misdirection, flow to the right there. Great blocking. Nicely, nicely done. All right, over the middle of the field. Finds the open space. Let's watch his route running. I mean, oh, he just gets behind the defense. I mean, nothing great there. Just in zone, gets behind the linebacker. Mac Jones puts it right on him. All right, running play out of the backfield. Finds the seam and picks up about 10 yards. Got the first down. Not bad there. So he doesn't have, like, game-breaking speed. He can't run up the middle and kind of run past anybody. He can't really break any tackles consistently here, just like that one. So, uh, I mean, he's great. Don't get us wrong. He's great so far. We love and everything. But I don't know if he's the he should be, um, you know, 
in the conversation of like Jamar Chase or Devontae Smith. Uh, but he, you know, for what he is, he's absolutely fantastic so far. Can take the top off the defense. We're seeing, we're seeing it again here. Underthrown by Mac Jones. Unfortunately, as we see this one, uh, we see him have to kind of slow it down, come back to the ball. But, I mean, very well done to go up and get this. I mean, this is contested. He goes up and finds the ball. So that's probably the most impressive thing. Yes, the speed is great, but high pointing the ball, attacking the ball. Great double move there on the outside. And then the concentration. He even leaps up to grab this ball a little bit more, leaping back into the defender a tad. Defender closing out quick, and he's still able to go and get that ball. So love it. Nice little wide receiver screen here again. Picks up 10, 15. Almost broken if he could have stayed on his feet. Going against Georgia here. Good competition. All right, Mac Jones going deep to him. Once again, Mac Jones is underthrowing these balls for this man. He's too fast for his own quarterback. And I know these are deep balls. What is this one? He's going to throw this from about the 15, so... You know, getting it down to the 40. So, yes, that is a big throw, and we get that. But still, I mean, if he throws this one out in front, this is going to be a touchdown. He's going to be able to kind of race him to the corner, and then it's just going to be a foot race if the safety can kind of come over quickly, which, you know, we know Waddle's got some great speed. So uh, maybe uh, this arm of uh, Mac Jones is uh, – but once again, I mean, just look at the concentration. You know, just he has to slow down, jump back into the defender while the defender is tackling him, and he's still able to get the ball. This is such freaking great work out there. He's got great hands, great hand-eye coordination to look in the ball while coming back. While getting tackled, while the ball is underthrown. So, this is pretty solid tape on this man, truly. Wide open here for the first down. Trying to do something right before the half. The end of the first half, so well done. Seems like they got that uh, field goal off. Mac Jones going deep again. Yes, sir. And there it is. It's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Defender just slips. Can't keep up with the speed and the technique. Do we get a replay of this one? Here it is. Watch this man just drop this defender. Trying to fight for the inside position. And then he just slips, falls, and he says, Sayonara. I'm Audi. Thank you. Check, please. Touchdown. And they take the lead with this play right here. I mean, he just gets behind the corner can't keep up he just can't keep up I mean do you look at the speed folks do you look at the speed I mean every single step is like five yards here it is one foot down five yard five yard five yard I mean every single stride with this man is five yards I mean what do we <laughs> how, how can you keep up with this man <laughs> Woof. fantastic yes sir yes sir yes sir is that it all right that is it for him so I, I don't think we need to watch this highlight package of the speed let's see if we get anything great here We'll just do random play right here. There he is. Oh, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. Look at this man just going. Be ah, yeah, very well done. All right. This man's got some nice speed here. Um, let's watch. Oh, man. All right. On a kick return, let's watch this one. Whoop. Yes, sir. One defender miss. Great blocking all the way he only really encountered one defender the entire way and he is gone look at that man try to leap to bring him down leaping that's not gonna do it no 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 <laughs> that's too slow baby come on you can't leap at me i'm gone i got jets on do y'all not know my name jalen waddle we'll finish up with this last play right here yeah i mean just look at that all right yeah this highlight package is with the speed all right just i mean just First of all, gets behind the defense and then just beats everybody to the corner. So, yes, Tyreek Hill speed is definitely a comp for this man, no doubt. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We definitely got to finish up this highlight package now because this is a great throw here. A great catch going up, high pointing the ball, getting two feet and uh, one foot in bounds. And that's all you need in college. So, fantastically well done there. Hopefully, he can get it to two feet down at some point. Is this Tua throwing to him? Is this Tua throwing to him? Yes, sir. Dolphins, go get this man. <laughs> go get Jalen Waddle at number three. Yes, sir. And then he just beats him. Don't you dare take that poor angle on me. What are you, nuts? What are you, nuts? I'm going to outrun everybody. Oh, yeah. So he didn't have any great outruns in that highlight package from 2020. But all these other ones from 2018, 2019. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Good night. I am outrunning everybody. 
All right, Alabama here. He's back. Reversing the entire field. Reversing the entire field. Oh, okay, I thought he was going to break it, but still, nice 20-yard pickup on that. Getting outside here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Weaving in and out of the defenders. He says, hang on, I'm going inside. Y'all thought I was going outside. Let me quickly turn it back up inside. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Gets behind the defense. Once again, high pointing the ball. Yes, sir. 50-50 ball thrown. A little underthrown. Slows down. Comes back. High points the, fall, the ball while getting hit by a defender. Oh, my God. He's sick. He's 5'10", folks, but he's playing like he's 6'2", and that's how you have to be in the league. Look at how far he jumps in the air for this one. We'll try to pause it. Look at this. Look at this. Out jumping this defender. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Give this man some respect. Oh, my God. What a hit. I know this isn't even Jalen Waddle, but watch this hit. Oh, my God. Woof. No wonder why this man was just returning balls for touchdowns all day long. Look at this man. Great blocking right here. Boom. Get out. <laughs> Get out of here. And then he turns the corner, and he's gone. Shifting back inside. Inside more. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Draft him. Draft him right now. Whatever you got. Number one, no Trevor Lawrence. Get Jalen Waddle. Oh, my God. Beating him to the corner right here. Front corner end zone. Getting the ball. Did he get two feet in bounds? Let's watch it one more time. Two feet. I want to see two feet. One, two. Yes. The toe drag. Woo. All right, now we're talking about a complete player. This highlight package is a little bit more better than the first one we watched. Woof. Jalen Waddle has our seal of approval, baby. Now two was thrown back to him. Wide open. Woof. Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. Yes, sir. Wide open. Speed. 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 Oh, my. Yo, this man is quick. Yes, sir. This man's Tyreek Hill. This man's Tyreek Hill. Right there. Just shifting right between those two defenders. No other wide receivers can really kind of turn on the Jets after that. And he beats them to the corner. Yes, sir. Oh, man. Definitely glad we watched this one because this one's looking a lot better, folks. This is what we're talking about, folks. The right highlight package. Oof. Jalen Waddle. Dangerous. Dangerous. Oof. Yes, sir. I want the Dolphins to take him. We got two first-round picks. We got to get him at some point. I definitely want Devontae Smith, but maybe I want Jalen Waddle a little bit more here. I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. Do you want size or speed? You want technique or speed? Speed is how you win in this league, I think. So maybe we go speed. I mean, Tyreek Hill was one of the leading wide receivers of this season. He's only 5'10", like Jalen Waddle. Damn, all right, that was impressive. All right, Jalen Waddle's got to respect. All righty, that is going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. We're back tomorrow, noon Eastern, doing the same thing. Breaking down the NBA. Doing a moneymaker. Talking stories in our draft prospect of the day. Who will be next? You have to tune in to find out. Alrighty, we're back tomorrow, folks. Like every single day. Alright, we're out of here.